and welcome to this episode of the GoTo podcast. I'm Charles Humble. I'm a freelance techie editor, author, and consultant. And this is the first in a mini series of podcasts that I'm going to be doing talking to engineering leaders. I'm aiming for each episode to have actionable insights and suggestions for further research, such as books and papers to read and conference talks to watch and so on. And for this episode, we're joined by Elizabeth Hendrickson. Elizabeth works with software development leaders and teams to improve collaboration, decision making and execution. She is a regular conference speaker and over the course of her career has done almost all the different facets of software engineering from Q&A to VP of R&D for Pivotal Software. Her book, Explore It, which was released in 2013, explores technical excellence and mastery and creating effective feedback loops for everyone. And Elizabeth has been hugely influential on my thinking around management and leadership, and I'm absolutely thrilled she's agreed to join us. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. That's wonderful to have you on. It really, really is. So uh, in the early 2000s, I was working on a project for a large UK retailer, where we had a vendor who was implementing what was effectively a custom solution on top of their base product. And they were using a long, complicated spec for the system that we put together. And what would happen is they would deliver us a build and we would test it and find frequently that either the build didn't work at all or didn't match the spec or a feature they claimed to have implemented hadn't been. And we kept adding time and we kept adding testers and it just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. And I also remember at the time, there was this supposed best practice around the ratio of testers to engineers, which was one to one. And uh, here I was battling with this project that was late and terrible and just a mess, but the, the ratio seemed to match the, you know, what we were supposed to be doing. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, I came across these two papers that you, you, you wrote. So one of those was Better Testing, Worse Quality, and the other, which you co-wrote with Dr. Ken Kaner and Jennifer Smith-Brock, was Managing the Proportions of Testing to Other Developers. I'll try and get links to both of those into the show notes because they're well worth reading. They stand up really well. I actually read them this morning when I was sort of thinking about this show. But can you talk about those papers? Because they had such a profound impact on me. So how did you get to them? Can you tell us a little bit about them? Uh, sure. So, um, for, for those who haven't read them, and by the way, it may be hard to get links to them because I took down my blog that was, as far as I know, the only like a place where you could find them. So we're going to have to collaborate on finding a place to put them. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah. but the, the, the first one you mentioned on the proportion that came that, that paper, the conclusion is that, um, although there are no best practices because we did not find a correlation between number of testers and good outcomes for the, the product, um, there, there was a worst practice and the, that was the more testers you had, the more likely your, your project was failing. And the way that we came up with that conclusion was out of a meeting of the software testers managers round table, a peer conference where, um, Brian Lawrence had us do an exercise. The topic was ratios because it was a hot topic at that point. And the facilitator, Brian Lawrence had us do an exercise of writing down on two stickies. One sticky was the ratio for the very best project that we had ever been on and the ratio for the very worst and then clustered those up on a, a board. And we saw this phenomenal pattern that the best were all over the map, but did not have typically did not have high ratios and the worsts all had really high ratios and mm -hmm. Digging into that, the, the explanation kind of makes sense because so often people want to believe in name magic that if we have a quality problem and we hire more quality people, obviously quality will go up and it turns out not to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> name <laughs> yes, magic, it turns out, does not work. If you have a problem work, and then you hire me. someone with the title for that problem, that does not magically fix the problem. Which brings us to the other paper. So the other paper came out of an experience that I had. It, 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 the, the impetus was one particular company where I was, oh, it was a nightmare. And um, it sounds kind of like the experience that you were having. We just were struggling to ship decent quality stuff. Things would come into QA and not work at all. We were struggling with integration times. We were struggling with everything. And uh, in the meantime, I was the head of 
quality engineering and we didn't have quality. So I was getting blamed. Um, and, uh, at one point my boss hauled me into his office and said, I don't understand. We have given you everything you asked for. We gave you budget. We let you hire people. We let you build out a lab and our quality is worse. What are you doing? And that really prompted me to have a very in-depth series of of self-reflective sessions and realized I had seen this pattern in other companies I had worked for. At that point, I had worked for two other companies um, full-time and had also been consulting and seen a bunch of other companies. And I'd seen this pattern where massive investment in testing weirdly resulted in worse quality. And it was partly that whole ratio problem that we we kind of saw the correlation on. But the other thing I realized was that it was a systems thinking thing and we were experiencing a side effect. And so the more investment we made in independent QA, independent testers, the more likely the development team who themselves were under a tremendous amount of pressure, the more likely they were to say, hey, look, there's a whole department over there just waiting to test our stuff. Why are we bothering to do any testing? And so the end result was that the feedback loops attenuated. They, they got so much longer. And so by the time we found bugs, first of all, we were black box testers. So we weren't using inside information about the code, which, you know, we, we did find things the developers never would have found, but we also didn't know where to look. And so we were kind of all over the place and we'd file all these bugs and then we'd have arguments about, is that a bug? Is it not wasting a huge amount of time? And the end result was that the developers had no idea what they were shipping to us. And we actually got so much worse. <laughs> And I saw it over and over again. And I've heard from so many people, yes, that describes the environment I was in. So I know that it wasn't just this one weird company. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that after 20 years, people still want to talk to me about this paper because it still happens. It does. Yeah, yeah, it, re it, it really does. And you, you would think in the intervening 20 years, you know, you kind of imagine that everyone's got this, but I, I really don't think they have. I actually think it's worth pulling it out because it's such a crucial observation. So essentially what you're saying is that when developers work with a downstream testing team, they tend to focus more on features because they know there's someone downstream who's going to catch the errors for them. And when they don't have that, they're more inclined to focus on, on quality because there's no one gonna, there's no one gonna catch a bug. Everyone wants to do good work, I think. Oh, and I, I think totally some of the other that. practices that we've emerged, you know, that have emerged since that you build it, you run it from Netflix is sort of getting towards the same outcome. It's this business of making developers responsible for the quality of the code that you write. But I think it's such an interesting example of how an organizational structure influences behavior in ways that you totally wouldn't expect. It's true. Turns out dividing I'm drawing the lines to divide between jobs, responsibilities. Turns out drawing lines is one of the hardest things there is. Yes. Yeah. So how does this principle apply to other non-functional requirements? We've seen it played out a bit with DevOps and we've seen it to some extent with security and sort of DevSecOps. But do you think there are other non-functional areas where this might also apply? I think that this is likely to apply, um, frankly, to anything where you separate the detection of issues so far organizationally from the creation of those issues. And this is one of those fundamental principles of drawing lines that um, – and it's not to say I don't value experts. To be super clear – Let's take security for an example. I, I know for a fact that I'm a dilettante. I have this much exposure to security issues and really value somebody who deeply understands security concerns, who follows the um, uh, security um, uh, uh, incident updates. I, I'm blanking right now on on the um, the, the the name of the thing. SEVs is that right? Yeah. The um, CVs or yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like I value people who do that and I want to get them closer so that we don't spend time building a bunch of stuff. Time passes, we detect an issue and now we have to go back and remediate an issue on top of a really shaky base. That's where things get get wrong. And so I look at like some of the things that are happening in our industry around AI, for example, and building and training models is a specialty. And then we're integrating that into apps. And if we separate the determination of whether that model is better or worse than the previous iteration of the model, if we separate that by so far, now we're going to have to go back and do stuff, you know, build on top of a shaky base. So I think that this concept of bring the disciplines closer together, preferably on the same team, if at all possible, but if not so close that we can collaborate as we're building the thing, I think that that is the way to ensure that we don't end up with this situation, that we make a huge investment downstream and it turns out to make things worse upstream. Right. Yes. Yeah, but one of the challenges with that, I think, and particularly in larger organisations, is that part of what you do as a leader is you divide work and responsibilities up. It's kind of like a natural thing to do. And I think we all know, in theory, we should have cross-functional teams and, you know, teams that could be fed by two pizzas or whatever it is. But but the reality in an awful lot of companies is, is we kind of don't have that. We still have silos and specialist organizations. I'm, never, I'm not really sure what to do about that, but it's, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how to approach, if you're in, in a rather more old-fashioned organization, I guess. Yeah, I think that in the last few couple decades, we've seen many, many um, iterations on matrix management. So back when I entered the industry in the late 80s, matrix management was a thing. And I remember being in my first organization that practiced it and we had um, discipline leaders and then we had cross-functional teams. And so I basically had multiple bosses and it was terrible. I'm going to be honest, that was terrible because it meant that if my direct HR boss who controlled things like my um, leveling and my my raises and things about my career at the company, if they didn't think I was doing the right thing, that was a problem. But if I wasn't serving my team and doing what the team leader for the initiative thought I should do, that was a problem. And if they were out of alignment, I was just, frankly, I was screwed. Please forgive my language. Um, and I think that many organizations still have this problem with matrix management, but I also think that we're slowly iterating our way to find better ways of doing this. And I look at the, the Spotify model. I look at um, what we did at Pivotal, frankly, was an example of matrix organization. But where things get different is the, the way that those two leaders are aligning to make sure that you very rarely have a circumstance where your HR manager is giving you different directions from the the team that you're on, if that makes sense. I, I don't know any other way to get past this notion that specialists do need to have a manager who actually understands what they do. When you don't have that, then you end up with the stuff that's considered less important, which typically is glue work, being undervalued, underleveled, underpaid. And, and you end up with typically an extremely engineering driven culture where designers, technical writers, anybody who isn't writing the code is undervalued, underleveled, underpaid. So, you know, that, that doesn't work. We need the people who actually understand the discipline to be able to hire for that discipline and staff teams. But we also need to have that cohesive team that is, uh, has a shared mission and is delivering together. Can you talk a bit about your experiences at Pivotal? Because I tend to think they were one of those companies that were quite ahead in terms of how they thought about organizations. And, and they maybe don't come up as often as some of the, you know, as the Netflixes and Spotify's, but I, I actually think they were a really they were a really interesting example. The sort of Pivotal Labs example I always thought was was kind of fascinating. So, can you talk a little bit about your experiences there? 
Oh, sure. Um, probably in way too much detail because I really enjoyed my time there. I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity. So the name Pivotal had come from labs and some people know it as Pivotal Tracker. And then um, what some people don't know is that it was a big spin out because Pivotal Labs had been acquired by EMC. EMC and VMware had a very close relationship and the two companies had come together to do a spin out. And so Pivotal, the company that I was the AVP of R&D at, um, was a uh, massive multinational that was primarily in the enterprise um, platform and kind of uh, enterprise uh, infrastructure space. We had databases. I was the VP of R&D for our data offerings, which included mm -hmm. Greenplum, a massively parallel uh, database that was originally a fork of Postgres and now has been re-merged. Anyway, too much detail, but um, uh, we had the data products. We had Cloud Foundry, which was our flagship product. Um, so that's that's the context. And then the thing is, how do you organize the work so that it achieves the objectives I just said, that you have people who understand the disciplines, but you also have teams that are fully aligned? And our answer to that was our own model that we pulled from Pivotal Labs. It was deeply inspired by the way that labs worked, but mm -hmm. it was adapted for the context of shipping enterprise quality software. And the, the basic core of it was that we had uh, teams that were loosely organized around components. So not, not small components, but big areas of the enterprise products. And the teams were staffed with engineers who frequently rotated. So we're talking like maybe three months on a team and then rotate to another team, six months. If you got to a year on a team, the, um, you probably were there for, for too long. It did happen sometimes, but here's what the rotations gave us. Um, empathy, because you would be on one team, rotate to the other team and realize, Oh, that's why we're having this conflict. And by bringing the DNA over, we're able to make the teams collaborate better, which is important for something the size of an enterprise product. Uh, we, we didn't have as many disciplines as, as maybe, uh, uh, some other organizations had. So we had, um, uh, uh, engineers were largely generalists. We had some specialists, like on the data products, we had specialists who had their PhDs in, in query optimization, but we very much favored the generalist model. We did have though a design practice and we had people within the company who were specialists in that. We did not have QA we, at all. We had some people who came in with deep testing experience and they ended up joining as engineers. We had a product management practice where um, product managers, given the nature of what we did, tended to have more of a technical background, um, but they really were um, in their discipline looking at how to distill the cacophony of conflicting demands and distill that into a roadmap and then slice that work going forward. So, um, the, but the, the core, the unit of work, the agent of work was the team in our world. And the team had a prioritized backlog and then was collaborating with other teams to get that all turned into something that could ship on a very regular cadence. And I'll take Greenplum as an example. When I joined, we were struggling to ship. Um, we weren't really managing to ship even annual major releases, um, but we were able to turn it around and get to the point where we could ship every single month, shipping a relational database every month. Phenomenal results from this way of thinking in terms of the team is the agent of work. We're going to rotate people between teams. We're going to make sure that they're fully supported. Oh, and th their manager was probably not on their team. So the managers, the engineering managers didn't manage a team. They managed people. That was a lot of detail. Was that what you were hoping I would yeah, talk about? Yeah, it really was. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I do remember the green plum thing a little bit because I was very, um, I worked in the sort of Java world for a long period of time. And so I followed through the, you know, spring, spring source and then the various acquisitions and mergers and things that happened. And I remember green plum coming in. And yeah, it's a fascinating example. And I love that thing about rotation and empathy because um, even in quite progressive companies, I think that's a trick that gets missed. And, you know, I've seen it, you know, 
my engineer, my background is all engineering, but I, I kind of increasingly work as a writer. And a lot of the times that ends up being in a marketing department, even though I'm quite technical. And you often see it with like engineers and marketing butting heads. And, you know, if we could just get an engineer to come and work in marketing for a bit or, or vice versa in some capacity, that would be really helpful. It would make a big difference. So, so I think it's something that, uh, that gets missed a lot. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is this business about how you align and manage teams when you've got high levels of autonomy. Because something that I've certainly seen is, is an organization where it's usually happened as the result of a, um, sort of an edict of some kind. You know, we're, we're, we're going to go to high trust, high autonomy. And so we go to high trust, high autonomy, but we forget the business of telling people what they're meant to be doing. And now nobody has the faintest idea what they're meant to be doing. And it's just chaos and mayhem. And, um, you, you know what I'm getting at, right? This is, I, again, I don't think this is un, an unfamiliar problem. So I'm curious as to how you would think about in a, in a, situation where you're trying to make teams more autonomous, how you also ensure they're, they're properly aligned and driving towards some common goal. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to start with the first statement you made about an edict that we're going to be a high trust environment because that oh, yes. always works. <laughs> Oh, always, always, Never <laughs> always, gets <wrong> totally. <laughs> you are going to have high trust in everybody. Absolutely. Matter. Yeah. No. The um, so the alignment piece is so crucial, and I think it's Henrik Niebuhr who has this wonderful cartoon about alignment um, and autonomy. And one of the panels is something like the, the the boss who's paying no attention basically says, "Wow, I hope somebody's working on that that bridge." Um, thing and everybody's off doing whatever they want. And there is definitely that risk. Um, and I think sometimes it is a little bit of a finding the sweet spot challenge. There were definitely times at Pivotal where we took the autonomy thing so far that we had teams producing amazing outcomes that were actually not in the best interests of the company because they put the value in a place that wasn't where strategically we needed to put the value. The teams did amazing work, but we weren't tapping into that innovation in a way that, that put all of the, please forgive me for using a cliche, all the wood behind the arrow. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So one of the things that I think that Ansi Fakuri, who was the, the EVP of all of, of R and D, um, and I, I reported to Ansi, I think he really did a good job of focusing on, on outcomes over output and, and finding the right place to explain outcomes so that then it, it does become a cascade without being a hierarchy. And that's a super hard thing to do. But the, the, um, if the overarching outcome relates to, um, the, the outcomes we want our customers to be able to achieve with our platform, but each of the different separate areas and their big areas under that need to do their part to achieve those outcomes, then it becomes a matter of the team at the next level of, of management to collaborate as a team. And I think that's one of the key pieces is that each leadership team needs to be a team, not a hub and spoke, but a team is two or more people united by a shared mission with a set of working agreements about how we're going to accomplish that mission and no individual sense of success or failure. The team either succeeds together or the team doesn't succeed, but there's none of this, well, my division did our part and you, you are all terrible. Um, the whole, it can't be in, in their side of the boat. It's, it's, we're all in the same boat. I know too many cliches, but the point is that we, at a leadership level, we operated as a team and we had a sense of what the overarching outcome we were trying to get to the goal. We had a sense of the constraints that we needed to work within. And we had a really solid foundation of a culture that valued and rewarded collaboration, transparency, um, uh, lack of, of empire building. So you really did get ahead when you were a good team player, player on a leadership team. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you were laughing about the, you know, the, the trust edict thing as well, which again is, as you say, it never works. But I, there was something that I was thinking about as you were talking, and it's, it's slightly orthogonal to this, but there is, there is a connection. 
as an industry, we are going through round after round after round of layoffs. It seems to me that everywhere, I, like every time I go on LinkedIn, more people, like people I know who are really, really good at what they do are being laid off, it seems like every day. And I just, I think there's there's a an aspect of trust and safety that gets a bit overlooked, which is that when an organisation lays, lays people off, it loses the trust of the people that remain. And it's really hard to get that back. Would you kind of agree with that? What, what are your thoughts there? In general, yes, totally agree. I think that there are different ways to handle it that can mitigate the damage. Um, but I, I think that no matter how well you handle it, there is going to be a certain amount of, oh, snacks. I should maybe update my resume and make sure that I am prepared because I can't trust that even if we don't do more layoffs, that I'm going to get a raise, that I'm going to get the, the, you know, bonus that was promised, whatever, or that, that I'm going to be able to advance my career. And so there is this, this little bit of, I'd better make sure that I am taking care of myself. Even if leadership has done everything they can to be super transparent, to um, handle, to, to treat people with dignity and respect and make sure that the people who are being let go have good packages and aren't being um, messed with on, on the way out that, that, you know, even if they do everything right, there is absolutely this little, going to be this moment of, I maybe should uh, not uh, pay as much attention right now so that I can do all of the things that I need to on LinkedIn to make sure that I am ready when it's my turn. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's something else here, I think, which is, it's not quite the same thing, but it's somewhat related, which is when an organization goes through endless reorganizations. Um, so that, you know, like reorging every few months. And again, it tends to be very large companies. And, um, it's interesting to me this. I think they do a reorg because there's the particular outcome they're trying to get to. And then they don't get the outcome they're expecting. And so they go, Oh, we'll do another one. And I think sometimes there's a, there's a sort of a failure to acknowledge that when you do a reorg, the various teams that are impacted need time to kind of, settle into the new structure, build the relationships again, build the, the trust again in order to be able to, to work effectively again. And again, it just feels to me this is something that gets overlooked a certain amount. Would you, again, is that something you've seen? Would you agree with me? Oh, I would agree with you a hundred percent. Um, I think even, so I'm not opposed to the idea of a reorg, the, the whole drawing lines thing, super hard. And sometimes you realize maybe the way that we drew lines in the past served us in the past, but doesn't serve us now. Maybe you realize the way we drew lines in the past created these silos that actually had these system effects that resulted in us spending more time on the, if the engine produces heat and work, more heat internally in the org. So I'm not opposed to reorgs, but when you said successive reorgs, one after the other, that's like the, um, the reorgs will continue until morale improves. Um, and <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, it not only doesn't, doesn't work because people do need time to really kind of settle in and understand, all right, so my team used to be responsible for this, or maybe I was on a team that was responsible for this, but now I'm on a team that's responsible for this other thing. And a, a good example is we at Pivotal, um, because we were a massive spin out, we had a few independent QA teams who we had some product areas that had independent QA teams. And we needed to reabsorb those for all of the reasons that I talked about, um, because those people were incredibly technical, great programmers. We needed to reabsorb them. Those people's jobs changed and people have feelings about that, which is totally legitimate. And they may have resentment and not want to have to go fix bugs because they liked working on test frameworks. And so giving people a chance to settle in. Um, really get comfortable with the new structure, get comfortable with their new manager, get comfortable with the new work, get comfortable with their new team is absolutely critical. I'm going to take it one step further. When you have an organization that's continually reorging, I think what you often end up with is what I'm going to call organizational scar tissue, mm -hmm. where just like with actual scar tissue, you lose mobility. 
you have a layer of people who have just been shuffled around, um, frankly, often with very little consideration about what they care about. So they've been shuffled around like pieces on a chessboard. And then you have a layer of people who are doing the shuffling, who are playing power games. And you end up de developing this distance between those. And the people who have been shuffled around like pieces on a chessboard become incredibly cynical. And right. that's, th they, at that point, you end up with Dilbert cartoons, Dilbert level of, uh, oh, is this a change that's going to stick? Or is this a, a, do I just need to wait it out? And I think that one was the, um, is this like a dead badger under the porch thing? Like it's going to stick around and stink for a while. Or is this something that we can ignore? Um, and, and so I think that actually organizations that do that are slowly losing their ability to be effective because they've got this dynamic of people who have been shuffled and feel powerless within a system that they don't care about and people who are all arm wrestling and playing power games up here with each other in politics. Uh, Dale Emery, my friend, taught me that politics is the big game of who gets to tell who what to do. So they're all playing the politics game up here. Yeah, it's really unhealthy and incredibly toxic. Yeah. yeah, it really is. It really is. I think that's actually super insightful. I love that. And also I think, you know, if you end up in a job that you wouldn't have applied for, do you know what I mean? If you're like reading the jobs back and like, well, you know, I quite like that aspect, but I really don't want that aspect. And when you end up with, as I say, with a job you wouldn't, wouldn't have chosen, again, I think that's, that's, that's really dangerous. Um, I want to talk a bit about your word count simulation because it's, again, I just think it's such a fun tool and such an interesting tool, actually. So can you, again, for people who don't know it, can you describe it a little bit for us? Totally. And I'll also say biggest hit, biggest flop. So <laughs> once upon a time, it's so, so here's how word count works. It's a full day in person um, workshop that uh, I learned early didn't scale real well. So sweet spot is about imagine 15 people in a room, people take on roles. So there's a table that has people who are in the tester role, a table that has people who are in the product manager role. There's a table with developers. And then there's a special role, the computer. Because one of my design criteria here is I wanted something that felt like software development without having to have people who necessarily knew any particular tech stack or had ever even coded before in their lives be able to feel that role of developer and experience it. And so the instructions for the computer to interpret are written in English language on index cards. And so when we start the day, everyone's in their silo and they're not allowed to talk to each other. And I've got a bunch of rules that I've put up on the, on the, the wall and I enforce them. You're the only way to communicate is through inter office mail, which is played by another participant. Somebody runs around with envelopes to pass notes to each of the, the groups. Um, and that's how we work for round one. They work for 15 minutes. Their goal is make as much money as you can. I play the role of the customer and I determine whether or not the system meets my criteria and therefore they make money. By the way, there's no tricks. I have the money, like literally in my hand, and I'm happy to give it to them. And my requirements are really close to the starting state. There's just a couple of bugs that they have to find. And the way they can find them is by discovering that I also have acceptance criteria in my other pocket. And all they have to do, all, ha, ha, ha that's, that's a lullaby word that, that you should substitute. They will have a great deal of difficulty doing. But all they have to do is get the, the acceptance criteria. There were three cards and make the system pass those. Very straightforward, except it turns out that the silos and the, um, the, the inhibition to communication means nobody ever made money in round one, ever. And I ran it over 150 times myself. Other people have run it. Um, you don't make money in round one. But after round one, we step back, reflect and adapt. The group gets to adapt to their practices, change how the thing works. And from that point forward, every room had a different, every, every time we ran it had a different journey. Um, but ultimately, 
the teams that did well ended up kind of reinventing agile practices. They, they merged teams. They became a highly collaborative cross-functional team. They may have blurred roles. They, some reinvented source control, um, on paper cards. Some reinvented continuous integration again on paper cards with stickers. Um, they, they did a variety of things. Uh, and some of the lessons that I got out of that are, uh, Inches, and I think there's research that backs this up, but I learned that inches make a difference. There was one team that, that, or one or uh, one group that failed to ship and, and they were getting, um, in the third round, oftentimes teams will ship and they were, they hadn't shipped yet. They, they had not yet made money. And they had kept their team, their, their tables, groups far apart because of the structure of how the room was organized. And at the beginning, in between round three and round four, they decided to shift things up by like, they got an inch or two closer. And all of a sudden it was like the entire system melted and they started flowing. And so little things like, like, uh, uh proximity to the people you're collaborating with makes such a huge difference. Um, the, uh, uh, uh fast feedback loops make such a huge difference. The, the groups that basically rediscovered test driven development and they're like, Oh, you've got acceptance tests. I wonder if we make those pass, let's do them one at a time. And one at a time, we're going to fix the code until this passes. And then we're going to make sure they all pass. And then we're going to get you to come accept it. Those teams did really, really well. Um, so I, I have so many stories that came out of it. I, but I will say, unfortunately, some people took away the wrong lessons because sometimes, especially when I let too many people in the room, what they learned was agile means we should fire half the staff. Um, nice. <laughs> because half the people ended up standing around watching the other half work. And that's why it was my biggest flop that, that people who sometimes got put into this by somebody else, they didn't choose to be there. They were informed you are going to this training. And then their experience in the training was they didn't actually get to contribute. They got to stand around while other people did interesting things. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's always tricky with those kind of, because it is a model at the end of the day, you're trying to demonstrate or, or, or demonstrate and or learn a thing, but it's not, it's not real world, and there's always that danger. I think there's a there's an interesting sort of general observation on on the various things we've talked about actually, which is how often your intuition leads you to the wrong conclusion. So, you know, one of my favourite examples is that if you've got uh, problems with delivery, you might think, well, we'll slow your delivery down because that will make me feel safer. And in the real world, that generally works. You know, if you're walking across a wobbly bridge over a crocodile infested river or something slowing down at least intuitively feels like the right thing to do but we've learned with software that that generally if you if you're able to release more frequently in smaller batches then it's sort of almost like anti-physics but the the the, the result is the software tends to be better because of the, the short feedback loops and so on i just think it's really interesting how often um as i say our intuition on these sorts of things is, is wrong yep hundred percent. And, and it's, it is understandable. I suspect that someone who is in good enough shape to run across that rope bridge very, very fast is actually reducing their risk because they are over the crocodiles for a smaller window of time. But no, it wouldn't no work question. for me. No I'm not in shape. Um, no. The other thing is that electrons and atoms behave differently. And we work in software. This is why I love software and why I don't do hardware because software, everything is malleable. We can change anything. We are not encumbered by laws of physics. We're encumbered by our own imaginations and, and only limited by that. Uh, and, and by our own ability to find new ways to think about putting things together, there is no physics. So that's, it's kind of what I love about this world. It's like magic. It is, it is. And there's something wonderful about um, having an idea and being able to and being able to realise it with this sort of very abstract process that we have. I, I still find that whole process kind of magical. Um, so you're now working uh, as a, effectively as an independent consultant, I think, right? So you have a small consultancy, uh, consultancy that's basically you and a few associates, I think. So can you tell me about that? What are you doing with that? What's interesting? What's exciting for you about the work you're doing now? 
Yeah, totally. Um, it's basically just me um, kind of just getting started again. I ran a consultancy a long time ago, uh, Quality Tree, which was small boutique and did work with a, a larger number of associates. Um, but at the moment, Curious Duck is is just basically I am the Curious Duck. Um, I, however, um, and the, the stuff that I'm doing, I'm coaching uh, executives, coaching VPs of engineering, um, and I, I doing cohort programs with leadership teams and doing the occasional fractional CTO kind of thing. So consulting. Um, the stuff that I'm super excited about, I've been building out this simulation of work flowing through a system, the Curious Duck simulation. Uh, and I've put a few videos up on, on YouTube and I'm continuing to work on that. And you mentioned that our intuitions are not necessarily very good at helping us understand um, really that uh, our intuitions lead us astray. And this is one of the reasons I built this simulation, because it allows us to make changes to the context, to the structure of the team, to the way that we've staffed the team, to the priorities with which we, you know, priorities we assign to work, and uh, then see what the result is. And the results can be incredibly surprising. And so actually seeing it simulated, I think, has power. However, I haven't really known what to do with the simulation until recently, when my friend and colleague, Joel Tosi, who I've known for a long time and have so much respect for, he has a system uh, systems thinking class that is really great. He takes systems thinking theory and economic theory, and um, he's pulled it together into this fantastic class. And he reached out to me and said, I think your simulation is a good fit for this. And so we're now collaborating on, on a, a new version of this class because systems thinking is such an important set of skills for anybody in a leadership position. It really helps you discover um, both the leverage points in the system where you have the opportunity to change things, but also the potential risks where you can have side effects coming all the way back to better testing, worse quality, being able to have a way to really visualize and think through not just the intentions, but the potential side effects of decisions that you make. That's fantastic. That sounds really, really interesting. Are there other resources around systems thinking that you would recommend, sort of books or, or if you're, if you're perhaps stepping into a leadership role and maybe this isn't something you've thought about, what would you, what would you suggest as a starting point? Absolutely. For um, the software end of things, practically anything by Jerry Weinberg, Gerald M. Weinberg. Uh, I studied with him and frankly, he's, he's the person who first taught me to systems thinking at all. Uh, and so all of his work is, is fantastic for systems thinking. And he has a four volume set quality systems management that is basically a primer on systems thinking for software development. Now it's been out for a while. So it's, it's not like the latest DevOps, DevSecOps, whatever thing it, but it is foundational. And I think it still very much applies, even though practices and tooling have changed since it came out. Uh, if you wanted to get super deep into systems thinking, there is an, it is an entire discipline unto itself, um, with works by Donatello Meta, Mel, Meadows, um, and, uh, Peter Senge, uh, uh, Peter Senge has the, um, well, that's embarrassing. I am blanking. The fifth discipline is, is his book, very popular book on systems thinking. Um, uh, so I think that, that you'll find, even if you just search systems thinking in your favorite book site, bookstore site, you will find a massive set of resources, um, around this. Fantastic. And, um, we'll try and get links to some of the YouTube videos from your flow simulation work as well. Cause as you say, some of those are really good fun too. Well worth watching. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time. It's been really lovely to chat to you. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate it.